I met Fred a couple of years ago at the SF Green Festival. Amid the organic food and soaps and different ways of using plastic, Fred had something different, something which could improve the lives of millions of poor people around the world. And I wanted to let Fred share that idea with you today. Well, Fred Colgan is the co-founder of Instove, a nonprofit which is designing, building, and distributing large, highly efficient cook stoves in developing countries. He's joined by Asa Sila Traore, Africa Project Coordinator at Instove. She is a Fulbright Scholar from Mali with 18 years of experience working with senior political and diplomatic leaders in Mali. Please join me in welcoming Fred and Asa. Ah, thanks, Dan. Thank you. Well, hi. I'm Fred Colgan. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Instove. Our full name is Institutional Stove Solutions. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization and a manufacturer of clean and efficient cook stoves and allied technologies for the developing world. Now, when you think of clean cook stoves, you may think of some gleaming new electric or gas range. And when you think of institutional kitchens, you may think of the fantastic workspaces you see on celebrity chef programs. But the reality in the developing world is more like this. Chances are your last meal wasn't prepared over an open fire, but for about one out of three people on Earth, it was. The cost of this is staggering globally. It leads to deforestation, climate change, illness, gender-based violence, and even deaths. And the social costs fall especially hard on the shoulders of women and young girls who do the cooking and fuel gathering. 2.7 billion people use open fires to cook. Today in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is our principal market, over 657 million people use biomass fuels like wood, charcoal, or dung as their primary source of household energy. While much of the planet is moving away from this model, in Africa, there are multiple barriers. Political instability, corruption, regional conflicts, all preventing many from gaining access to electricity or to modern fuels. The reality is that the infrastructure simply is not enough to deliver electricity and modern fuels. It's not growing fast enough to meet demands either current or projected. Every few years, the International Energy Agency does an assessment of energy use worldwide. They collect their findings and analyses in a report called the World Energy Outlook. I want to share one finding of the IEA in their 2011 report. While Africa's share of the global population increases from 15% in 2009 to 20% in 2035, its share of global energy demand declines fractionally to 5.4% over the same time frame. Furthermore, one third of the total energy demand in Africa by 2035 takes the form of traditional biomass use. In that same report, the IEA projects that the number of people in sub-Saharan Africa who will use biomass as their primary source of fuel will be over 900 million people in 2035. That means in Africa, two decades from now, the number of people burning wood to cook will have grown by almost 50%. The environmental damage from this is twofold. First, the open fire cooking produces a long list of noxious chemicals like benzene and methane and toluene. But the black carbon and particulate matter is especially impactful on climate change. It's estimated that open fire cooking in the world produces more climate change emissions than the one billion cars on the planet. Second, the unsustainable harvesting of firewood destroys the very forests that help to mitigate climate change. On average, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, the level of deforestation is between 3 to 4% of existing forests each year. And in some regions, like in northern Nigeria, that deforestation rate climbs to over 11% per year. 
Deforestation brings with it a cascade of environmental and social problems that include acceleration of desertification and the loss of watersheds, the loss of habitat, and the loss of livelihoods that depend on forest ecosystems. But the costs of open fire cooking have a human dimension as well. The most recent Global Burden of Disease study published last year in The Lancet found that 4.3 million people die each year from illnesses caused by exposure to indoor air pollution. By way of comparison, more people die each year from cook smoke than from HIV AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. And this statistic does not include those who die or become disfigured by burns sustained while cooking. This statistic does not include the eye diseases, including cataracts and macular degeneration that come from exposure to indoor air pollution, which often lead to blindness. And this statistic does not include the gender-based violence suffered by women and young girls who cook outdoors and who trek long distances, often through dangerous territory, in search of firewood to gather. These women and girls must continue to go out because gathering firewood is, the only, is not only necessary for their family's survival, it's often the only income generating activity available to them, especially in refugee camps and internally displaced persons camps. When I went to Niala and Darfur in 2011, I was fortunate enough to work with a large group of African women who were cooks in the schools in the camp. And after I gave a demonstration at one camp, a focus group of cooks told me that they have to travel outside the camp to gather firewood, and one out of every three times they go out, they're sexually assaulted. These problems are enormous, but at their root is a solvable engineering problem. How do you design a stove to make biomass cooking more efficient? one that uses minimal amounts of fuel while producing minimal amounts of emissions and being safe for users. In 2005, I wasn't aware of most of this, though I had some developing world experience. I was 60 years old and my wife and I moved to Oregon to retire to a little place on the bank of the Willamette River in, in Oregon. I had planned to reread my science fiction uh, library uh, in my retirement years. But that plan wasn't, plan wasn't uh, meant to be. Uh, the property we bought had an abandoned slaughterhouse and meatpacking plant on it. So I restored this building, and our first tenant was Aprovecho Research Center. This is a nonprofit research group that's been working for 30 years on the design and development of clean biomass cookstoves, including the iconic uh, rocket stove. And almost immediately, at Aprovecho, I met Damon Ogle. Now, Damon was a retired mechanical engineer who had spent many years uh, with a successful independent business with portable rock crushing mills, um, providing rock crushing to uh, government and, and mining clients throughout the western U.S. Damon took an early retirement and he began looking for ways to put his engineering experience to humanitarian use. Eventually, his interest in water and sanitation systems in the developing world led him to Aprovecho, who were world-recognized leaders in appropriate technology and within driving distance for Damon. He joined Aprovecho as a volunteer, and he began devoting the second half of his life to using his engineering talents to give back to humanity. After spending several years of designing household stoves and implementing stove projects throughout the developing world, Damon began focusing on building larger institutional rocket stoves. In places like refugee camps and schools and hospitals and rural clinics, household stoves are simply not sufficient to meet the need. These are institutions where large quantities of food are prepared quickly. This kind of cooking presents a different design challenges but because of the high level of use and fuel use and the high level of resultant emissions, Damon saw that when you place one improved institutional stove, the impact is an order of magnitude higher than placing a household stove. 
at Aprovecho, Damon learned about the 10 rocket stove principles from their creator and our friend, Dr. Larry Winiarski. These 10 principles are as follows. First, insulate around the fire with a low mass heat resistant material. The objective of this is to create a refractive combustion chamber. The goal is not to heat the stove, but to heat the pot. Number two, use an insulated upright internal chimney immediately above the fire to promote mixing of the gases, the pyrolytic gases, and to complete the combustion. Number three, design a stove to heat and burn only the tips of the sticks as they enter the combustion chamber. This is analogous to avoiding burning too lean or too rich in a gasoline engine. Number five, design the stove to maintain high air velocity through the system. And number five, do not allow too much or too little air to enter the combustion chamber. Strive to have a stoichiometric or a chemically ideal combustion. This can best be achieved by not jamming the fuel slot with wood. Too much fuel blocks airflow and it causes incomplete combustion and it um, produces smoke. Number six, maintain constant cross-sectional area throughout the stove to eliminate bottlenecks. And number seven, elevate the fuel and distribute airflow around the fuel. The stove works best when the fuel added is separated by a shelf that allows this airflow. And number eight, use a grate under the stove, <clears throat> under the fuel, so that the air flows through the coals. Traditional stoves or open fires that have fuel resting on the ground experience difficulty achieving the correct mix of air and fuel. Number nine, insulate the heat flow path to and around the cooking surfaces. As you can see in this and in most household rocket stoves, this is only partially achieved. The heat flow path to the pot is insulated, but not beyond the bottom of the cooking surface. And finally, number 10, optimize the gaps around the cooking surfaces to maximize heat transfer without slowing down the draft. The supports that elevate the pot above the stove in this kind of rocket stove create the most critical gap where the heat transfer is reduced if the gap is too small, is too large, and a choke point is created if the gap is too small and it makes a smoky fire. Now Damon took these principles and applied them to designing an institutional cook stove and what he ended up with was a stove that looks like this. Now this stove has been designed to best run on small amounts of small wood, little sticks that can be sustainably harvested. In contrast, open fire cooking for institutions tends to require large amounts of large wood to generate enough heat energy for the large pots they use. Most of this energy is wasted. A really efficient three stone fire is at best only about 15% thermally efficient. That means 85% of the heat energy never reaches the pot. Our stove from the moment heat energy is generated forces heated air to flow up through the stove following a path that provides maximum opportunity for heat exchange with the cooking surfaces to the bottom of the pot and then along its sides as well. Additional heat is retained in the stove in this chamber by the metal skirt or the pot surround. As gas is descended to another insulated space, we improve efficiency with retained heat. Then the gases exit the stove through the external chimney. This design creates an optimum draft which pulls the heat at a constant velocity through the system. With the stove, we have reached 50% thermal efficiency. By way of contrast, the average internal combustion engine is about 20% efficient. And the Prius we drove down here today is about 40% efficient. With this stove, we get more work out of wood than modern combustion engines get out of gasoline. In 2007, when Damon first began designing what he was calling a barrel stove. 
Dr. Winiarski, the father of rocket stoves, was also working at Aprovecho. And, and Larry had a drawing of a design for an institutional stove that didn't have a metal combustion chamber. At the time, the, the conventional wisdom was you can't use metal to build rocket stove combustion chambers. But Damon was stubborn, as engineers who are right sometimes can be. And he said, everyone thought ceramic was the way to go, but my experiments keep showing that the best results came out of a metal combustion chamber. So Damon designed his metal combustion chamber and wanted to build and test his uh, barrel stoves in the field where the experiment would do some good. So he so soon found a place that needed some stoves. At the time, our friend Ken Goyer had just started Aid Africa, a nonprofit in northern Uganda, where the Lord's Resistance Army, led by Joseph Kony, was terrorizing the region. And Damon traveled there in 2007, and he brought with him through customs a dozen different combustion chambers, each made from different high temperature uh, alloys not available in African markets. And Damon trained a team of local workers to build this first 12 prototype stoves using local pots and local parts, but use the combustion chambers that he had brought to make a variety of field testing prototypes. He placed the stoves in several institutions, including the LaRue School for War-Affected Children. And a year later, he came back to measure how the different combustion chambers had worked and held up when put through rigorous daily use. When he returned to Oregon after this to design the first 60-liter stoves, that's when I met up with him. Now, Damon and I hit it off pretty quick and realized we shared a passion to serve and a vision of realistic approaches to the development and the proliferation of technology to serve the world's poorest people. We continue our close collaboration, and Damon today still directs our research and development department, and I head up the day-to-day -day operations of our organization. In 2008 and 2009, we continued testing and tinkering and improving Damon's model. And our first break came in 2010 when the German International Cooperation and Aid Agency called GIZ asked us to do a pilot project with 60-liter stoves in a girls' school in Bida in northern Nigeria. Uh, the Bida Girls' Secondary School is an amazing place, a school with 1,600 female students divided between Muslim and Christians where there are no religious conflicts. And I traveled there in 2010 and installed three stoves which reduced the school's fuel costs by 75%. The stoves were so efficient that they paid for the installation in seven months. Four years later, these three stoves are still providing the food for the 1,600 students. And the head cook, Haja Ishmael, the woman who brought her infant son with her to work on her back every day, shared this with me. With the new stoves, my eyes don't water, my chest doesn't hurt, my back doesn't ache, and the baby on my back has stopped crying. This project was so successful, we soon had an order in hand from a UN agency for 200 stoves for Darfur. Since 2010, we've placed over 1,000 stoves in 25 countries, including 15 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, Damon and I agreed early on that bringing not just the technology, but the production of stoves to a country, just like he had done in Uganda, was the ultimate goal. So we developed a stove production method to be repl replicable and created a method we call stove factory in a box. Now in this model, we put all the materials and tools necessary to build our stoves into a shipping container. We ship this container to an in-country partner. And then following the arrival of the container, we send a team of in-stove stove builders to teach local workers how to replicate our manufacturing process. What we found in our research and development of the stove was that the difference of a few millimeters can cost 15 or 20% in efficiency. 
Our stoves require precision manufacturing, so we designed our system to force precision through the use of custom jigs and very exacting standards. Our factory runs on minimal energy and can easily be powered by the few tasks that require electricity with a small generator. By transferring our tools and know-how, we can train in-country workers to build stoves to our precise one millimeter tolerances. And with stove factory in a box, we can bring production anywhere in the world. Our goal for each country where we are needed is to begin with small pilot projects and then bring a larger number of stoves for market testing. And then if there's sufficient demand, we explore partnerships and pursue funding to open a factory in country. By opening these local factories, we create living wage jobs, we increase local economic independence, and we make our stove initiative truly sustainable. By now, you may be wondering, well, how good are our stoves, really? From the beginning, and for seven years, we've continued to improve our design, testing it in the lab and in the field. And now our stoves are independently verified by third-party testing labs and by hundreds of users in the field to consistently accomplish the following results. They reduce carbon monoxide and particulate matter emissions by 90%. They cut fuel use by 75 to 90 percent, and they reduce cooking time by 50 percent or more. The International Standards Organization has an international workshop agreement, or IWA, that's measuring clean cook stoves in 11 categories or indicators that are ranked on a scale from one to four, with four being the highest ranking. In nine out of these 11 indicators, our stoves are ranked four. These indicators primarily measure emissions, including carbon monoxide and particulate matter, produced at both high and low powers. In the world of stoves, high power means the power you need to bring a pot of food to a boil or a pot of water to a boil in the lab, and low power means the amount you need to keep it simmering um, as you cook. In our stove, the temperatures within the combustion chamber reach up to 1,150 degrees Celsius. That's over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And our stove is burning so hot that it literally burns up the smoke. But how does this compare to other stoves? This chart completed by researchers across the bay at the Berkeley Air Monitoring Group compare particular matter and carbon monoxide produced at high power in different kinds of stoves including charcoal stoves and pellet stoves, fan-driven stoves that require electricity, chimney stoves and griddle stoves, and finally liquid or gas stoves. And our institutional rocket stove tests here. This puts our stove two categories above household rocket stoves, and it puts it nearly on a level as clean burning as liquid fuel or gas stoves. The only way to improve our performance would be to change the fuel. And until natural gas or LPG grows on trees, this probably isn't a viable alternative. As to cost effectiveness, our stoves are so efficient that in fuel savings, they pay for themselves in most cases in just over a year of use. Here you can see our stove being used alongside some really rudimentary improved stoves in Senegal. When we set up our stove to cook here, we couldn't find any small wood prepared because they use large wood to heat their large pots of food. So we had to find that the smallest stick we could find was this one you see jammed into the fuel slot. Our stoves run best on small amounts of small wood that can be sustainably harvested without destroying whole trees. But our stoves do more than cook. Institutional stoves produce much more firepower than other stoves, and this energy can be harnessed for additional applications. Our 100-liter stove works with a gravity-fed flow-through water pasteurizer of our own design. And this pasteurizer can produce over 200 gallons of potable water per hour using just a pencil's weight of wood, 
about five grams for each liter produced. We field tested this pasteurizer in the Zambia in October of 2013. And in the field, just as in the lab, the pasteurizer eliminates 100% of waterborne pathogens. With the support of the Geist Foundation, we're now in the research phase of creating a high flow sand filter that will allow us to address the issue of turbidity of particulate matter in the water. With this upstream filter, we'll be able to filter out solids and make water look as clean and safe as it really is. We're exploring partnerships to implement this technology as part of rural micro utilities that can provide clean water and sanitation and hygiene trainings. And we're looking at, the ba at this pasteurizer as the basis of a micro business providing clean water. Our 60 liter stove is also paired with an autoclave that can sterilize medical equipment, making used supplies like bandages, dressings, and scalpels. It's okay, also. yeah, you wanna, you wanna do that? Okay. <clears throat> bandages, dressings, scalpels, needles can be safe for reuse or for hygienic disposal in accordance with international medical standards. This ensemble is already saving lives in Kenya and Chad and Zambia and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Thank you. And we just completed a pilot project in Kathmandu that will introduce our autoclave to rural clinics across Nepal and help remote centers there arrive at international standards in their waste disposal practices. This pilot project also represents our first um, uh, a entry into Asian markets. Because all of our technologies have been designed to work off the grid, they're ideal for use in settings where electricity and modern fuels are scarce or unavailable. Places like rural hospitals and clinics, or refugee camps, or in disaster relief situations. We have a long list of R&D projects intending to use the stove for additional applications. On our list are a bread oven, a water pump, a refrigeration system, and a cell phone charging station, all powered by the end stove. We're a nonprofit organization, and we raise funds from philanthropic donors and sell stoves to support our mission. With the importance of the problems we solve, and the effectiveness with which we do it, it might at first seem hard to believe that funding and clients are difficult to both find and maintain, but the markets for stoves face many challenges, not least of which is the volatility of funding cycles. Our strategy for growth is to build strategic partnerships with agencies small and large throughout the world Getting life-changing technology to the world's poor is why we exist. Our mission is to improve health, to enhance safety, and to reduce harm to the environment through the design, the manufacture, and the delivery of highly efficient stoves and allied technologies to the most, most vulnerable populations worldwide. We've joined the larger United, unified fight against indoor air pollution as members of the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves. It's a public-private partnership led by the United Nations Foundation. The Global Alliance was born in 2010 when then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and a range, and a range of leading international public and private figures launched it with the ambition, ambitious mission of transforming the global market for clean cook stoves and fuels, with a specific goal of spurring the adoption of clean cook stoves and fuels in 100 million households by 2020. The Global Alliance is leading the way in raising consciousness around this issue, and I think they said it best. While some may think that the poor cannot afford to adopt clean cooking technologies, the opposite is in fact the case. The poor pay heavily for their lack of access to clean cook stoves 
and fuels. As we grow, our priorities are to open strategic foreign production units, to bring production in-country to the countries that need our stoves the most, to improve our value chain management, to increase our capacity, including creating several new staff positions, to hire African staff, especially in the area of marketing and last mile distribution, and to expand into new markets. It's with these last two priorities in mind that I'd like to introduce you to Asatan Silla Treori, the newest member of Instove's team. Thank you. Bonjour tout le monde. Y a-t-il des francophones dans la salle? Oh, enchanté. Gavarite Paruski. Tout le monde Gavarite Paruski. Abe Bamananka Mea. Il veut donner me? Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate it. I'm here today to put a human face on the work Instove does around the world to protect women and save the planet. My name is Asa. I'm Instove Africa Project Coordinator. I come from Mali, West Africa, from an extended family. I have nine siblings. However, my mom cooked to, cook, to feed over 20 people. She raised over 20 children. I have four children, and like my mom, I've been cooking alone to feed the family. Before coming to the United States, I went to school in Russia and graduated from Moscow Linguistic University with a master's degree in linguistic. I returned back home to Mali and worked for 18 years in diplomacy and government and in the nonprofit sector. I worked as special assistant to eight ambassadors of Nigeria to Mali. I also worked as special assistant with Mali government under the prime minister office. I've been always interested in gender issues and intrigued by the disparity between women and men in our society. So this motivated me to create a nonprofit called ASFAM in Mali to address issues like girls' education and women's financial uh, independence. However, after 18 years of experience, I felt that I needed to learn more and realized that I need to learn more to address better the issues women are facing in my country. I therefore applied for and was granted a Fulbright scholarship to study at the University of Oregon in gender, environment, and environment, environmental issues and women issues. So I first met in stove during a stove demonstration at the University of Oregon. I immediately saw the importance of their work on women, children, and the planet. So when I graduated in the fall of 2013, and they offered to hire me as Africa Project Coordinator, I immediately accepted the offer. Unlike in the United States and in most developed countries, the most common ways of cooking in most African countries, even today, is cooking with wood over a three-stone fire, exactly as you see on this picture and as is shown here. All generations in my family have cooked with wood over a three-stone fire, including myself. One of my cousins was severely burned when he was an infant. While my aunt was holding him on her lap and stirring food from a pot, the fourth pot accidentally fell on him and burned him badly. So he was disfigured and he could no longer use his left hand as a normal person. He's an adult now, married with his chil with children, but he still has bear the consequences of the open fire cooking method. Growing up, I've seen my mom cook with wood over a three stone fire. The walls of our kitchen back home are all black from smoke. Traditionally, being able to stand smoke while using a three stone fire 
is the rite of passage for all girls. I remember once asking my elder daughter, Fatu, to start fire because I needed to fix breakfast for the family. So she tried for hours, the fire wouldn't start. And her eyes were red, she was coughing, and our tiny kitchen was filled with smoke. And she kept telling me, Mama, I can't start the fire. And I kept telling her that she needed to start hard, to, to try harder, because I thought she was just being lazy as all teenagers. So when I came to the United States years later, I started taking classes and learning new things that challenged the belief I was taught while growing up that all girls needed to learn how to start fire, no matter what. I realized that I was too hard on my daughter, and I picked up the phone one day. I called her to apologize for being so hard on her. But I was trying, I was simply trying to prepare her to become a better woman, as I was taught when I was a child. So cooking with a three stone fire method has a lot of consequences on women, on people, and the environment. It leads to deforestation because the need is increasing, the demand is increasing. It also leads to gender-based violence because women have to walk farther in the bush to collect wood for the needs of the family. So open fire cooking also contributes to a lot of diseases like eyes, lungs, heart disease. I have two of my daughters who have been diagnosed with asthma from smoke. Open fire cooking contributes also to burns, as was the case with my little cousin Mamadou when he was an infant. It's also a big loss of time for families because it takes hours to just set the fire. And because it's not efficient, most fire does not go directly to the pot because it's open and it takes a lot of time. And women could use this time to carry out other income generating activities to support their families. Oops. So today, as an African woman and a mom who have lived all these things INSTOV has been trying to address, I think that it is unacceptable today, in this age of high technological development, for women and girls to continue to suffer, to expose their lives to danger, and harm their health, just because they want to feed their families. But it does not have to be like that, because there is an alternative to the three stone cooking fire method. In stove, cook stove is here. It's safe, very fast, efficient because they do not use a lot of uh, wood and they do not produce any smoke. So on this picture, you can see the quantity of wood needed to cook the same amount of food. One, the small one using an, an in stove cook stove and the big one using a three stone open fire cooking method. So I was curious, so I tried one day to experience by myself cooking with an in stove because I have experience already cooking with a three stone fire back home and I really wanted to cook with an in stove to see how efficient it was. And it was so easy, I started it myself and it was very easy to start. So as you can see on this picture, and you also have a relaxed posture. When you are using a three stone fire, you have to all the time bend down and you cannot even use your nice clothes to cook because they will be dark with smoke. And after you finish cooking, your clothes will stink. You cannot even serve the food without taking a shower before. So I was relaxed and I could cook with dignity, even in my nice clothes using an in stove which is not possible with a three stone cooking fire method. So it was very fast and I could put the uh, stove anywhere in the house 
and without worrying about my walls being dark or smoke being around the house. So it was a great experience, and it's a very efficient stove. So how can all of us together address these issues? So I really believe in the mission InStove is doing around the world to save the environment and protect women. Because I have lived all these issues InStove is trying to solve, and I have experience about all the things he's trying to address. So I hope that all of you here today will join me to support InStove to bring this life-saving stove to people who need it the most around the, the world. So you can be involved by trying to learn more about us on our website in, by typing www.insove.org. We have a great volunteer program. You can volunteer with us in Eugene or in Cottage Grove, Oregon. And also, you can help us with new ideas, because there is always room for improvement. And also, you can support our mission. We are a small nonprofit, and our work is being made possible by donations from our supporters. So on this note, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, Fred and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Um, I was wondering how much it costs to install an in-stove, like generally. OK. Um, um, the pricing is this stove, this 60-liter stove, costs $950 US. That's our humanitarian price. We have a stove nearly twice as big, which is a 100-liter pot. And that's $1,300 US. So we're priced for institutional cooking. Um, and where these are placed primarily are organizations that have some sense of cost-benefit analysis. So they can, they can see very, early, very quickly that the stove pays for itself very quickly, just with fuel costs alone. Yeah. I was curious, um, just like if you were to do like a big fundraising effort, you know, sometimes for people it's it's better to see like, oh, you're buying X amount of stoves, yeah, with, sure. you yeah. know, to s try to set fundraising goals and stuff. Yeah, we partner with a lot of NGOs, so a lot of groups come to us and say, well, we want to get two stoves for our for our project and our the the um, orphanage we support in Kenya. Um, so they raised the money for a couple of stoves, and bingo, there they are. And that's how we got to many of our countries around the world. And I, what I would like to add is that our stoves are designed for use in institutions like school feeding programs, orphanages, hospitals, where people cook large quantities of food to feed many people at a time. Yeah. So they are not meant for family. Yeah. This is the institutional yeah. size. But there are also a commercial applications. So commercial cooks could, could use this stove and save money and save and protect their health at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you so much. Um, um, as I said, I'm from Ivory Coast. And my childhood being um, similar to yours, I was lucky enough to move from the village at an early age to go to the city. So um, that saved my eyes a little bit, but not. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, and thank you for this great uh, invention, uh, really. I mean, have you thought of, um, I know that you think of bigger uh, institution and kind of bigger cooking. And I can see uh, it's really good to, 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 to be able to do that. But have you thought also in terms of family, kind of? Because um, in some part of Africa nowadays, I mean, where's the relatively peace, the bigger concern remain in terms of feeding the family in a small kind of, have you thought of that? And also when you go to Africa in a big in, in institution, what are the challenges you, you face? Have you uh, had something okay. that you... Well, okay, several <laughs> questions there. Um, first, household stoves. Um, we, we decided early on to address this one niche, to build institutional cook cook stoves for institutional situations. That's about 10% of all the cooking that takes place, particularly in Africa. Um, household cooking, 
There are a lot of players now in the global markets. The Global Alliance is promoting the development of household stoves primarily. It's uh, much more complicated than institutional cooking. Household stoves need to be designed for very low prices to accomplish a lot, and then they need to be adopted by women whose primary interest is that the food tastes like their grandma's food tasted. And that's very tricky to do, to change technologies. So it's, been, it's, it's an ongoing challenge to convince women to change their cooking habits, to adopt more modern stoves, and also to come up with the money to pay for them. It's at, at 10 or 15 or $20, that's a very expensive stove in African markets. And it's very hard to deliver an industrial product for those kind of prices. So, like I said, there are many players. We're, we're focused on institutions, um, and we're going to let our colleagues address the, the household cooking issue. Um, we may get drawn into that at some point, but um, for the moment, we're going to stay focused. The challenges, the challenges are huge, um, logistical challenges. To get stoves from Oregon to anywhere in Africa, um, there are all kinds of there are all kinds of issues that come up. Just the raw logistics of getting uh, shipments into country through customs, past corruption, and into the hands of users is very challenging. Um, finding funding sources, finding agencies who can afford the stoves and can afford to participate in development is very tricky. Um, it's there are a host of problems host of challenges, I would say. Um, still, we're still overcoming them. We're learning to overcome them. Um, we have a container of stoves arriving this week in Kampala in Uganda for a wider distribution. So that's the second tier of our development strategy. We're learning. We're a small organization. Some of my team are absolutely fantastic at logistics and now increasingly um, at developing markets in, in Africa. So. What is the lifetime for a stove? Well, when we started, we weren't sure. We've, we've had stoves in the field now for, for four years with almost zero failure rate. Um, so we're waiting for that first failure point. We think somewhere in year five, year six, we're going to see some deterioration of some of the parts. Um, but these are Inter interchangeable parts. So with maintenance, we're, we're confident 10-year lifespan is possible and maybe longer. Um, the only stoves that have failed have been left out in the rain. And, um, so it, we're looking at very, very long livelihood for these stoves. Um, I want to thank you for coming. And I want to thank you, Dan, for hosting us and making this possible. And um, for thanks. Yeah, thank and you. please. Uh, Please don't hesitate to contact us, and please spread the word about us. We, we only survive by the partnerships and the collaborations that we make. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you.